We meet here today to celebrate the construction of the 117-mile Sunrise PowerLink transmission line. Safety is number one, and when we mean that, everybody wants to go home at the end of the day. It's a major undertaking. Every day that nobody gets hurt is a good day. Like no other project that I've ever seen in my lifetime. Communications and safety go hand in hand. We have a new set of challenges each day. We're going to have a lot of people exposed to a lot of risk. Safety is number one job one for us in this company. I'm really proud for what we've accomplished. It's nothing less than amazing. I'm pretty passionate about <laughs> safety. <laughs> Hard hat, safety glasses, work boots, vests for visibility, respirators if you need them. Our incredible safety performance on Sunrise, it, it's a 117 mile construction project. It really was the result of a lot of focused effort from a tremendous number of people. Really, and it all started with SDG&E's safety first culture. The commitment to safety is one that is long-standing in our company, from the CEO's office to the president and the chief operating officer in terms of setting the expectation for how we approach work at sdg &E. We don't take shortcuts. At the end of the day, everybody needs to come home from the project safe and sound. And that expectation has now made its way into the individual employee's approach to how they do their work. The crews themselves take a lot of pride in the construction that they do. They've definitely done a good job stepping up and making sure everything's done safely. I've been in construction for over 24 years and I've never seen a company this dedicated or put this much time and effort into the safety of its personnel on a project of this size. And I would say that that culture was pervasive throughout the, the contractors as well. It was put out to them right from the get-go how important safety was going to be on this project. The way you are now is the way we want you to leave the job at the end of the day. And if you look at the performance on the project, we've got an exemplary record and it is probably far superior than comparable work anywhere else in the industry. There was a significant amount of training for this project. A safe worker and environmental awareness training, a fire safety and prevention, had elaborate helicopter training, communications training, dealing with Sunrise Base, Smith System driver training. And just generally get them a basic orientation of what are the major concerns out here and then they're able to go out and start working on the right of way and understand what's expected of them. So from a helicopter training perspective, we were two missions. One, those people flying, working in or around or under a helicopter. And then the other part was for the operators. Normally, bring them in, interview them, you uh, review the resume, you cut them loose to go work on the project. For us, a week-long orientation for a pilot coming in. It took a while for us to get the pilots up to speed on, again, not how to fly the helicopter, but how to fly the helicopter safely and in compliance with our mitigation measures. You need to understand there is two separate fire plans. Sunrise PowerLink fire plan, the Forest Service plan is in addition to that. So when we're on Forest Service land on the right-of-way, there's additional and more restrictive things we have to do to be in compliance. We give them kind of simple rules to live by, which are, are literally to live by. It was kind of based, if you will, on a, a three-step process, fire prevention, eliminating all those things we can that can cause fire, and then immediate or early detection if we were to start a fire, and then the third step, rapid extinguishment if it is. There's basically two schools of thought with safety. There's zero tolerance and there's behavior based. The idea with zero tolerance is you're sort of a policeman and you walk around and if you see somebody not doing what they're supposed to do, you fire them, you write them up, you kick them off the job, you give them time off, that sort of thing, where they're in trouble. But the behavior based safety, the worker formulates a plan for completing the task and how they can do it safely. And the idea behind it is that they'll do it the right way even when you're not watching. We can prepare all we want on uh, these projects leading up to them and all the proactive safety measures, but the reality is with the type of work going on, the amount of work going on, incidents are likely to occur. And we had a tremendous amount of safety challenges on the project. Unless you've walked it, unless you've been out there on a day-to-day -day basis, it's hard to explain 
you know, how tough that really is and to sit back and watch these guys drill foundations and set steel and pull wire, huge challenges. You really can't convey how rugged some of these canyons are. They're not huge in size, but they're deep enough and they're rocky enough and remote enough that getting people in and out of them is, is a real challenge doing it safely. If it wasn't a fly-in site, employees typically would have to hike in. So we ensured that everybody had proper footwear and personal protective equipment while they're working. Making sure that employees were prepared was a very, very important part of keeping people safe. Here I am, my first day on the project, out in the field, ankle deep in snow, going, really? This is what we have to look forward to? We've had issues where it was up over 120 degrees, 122. As we learned in the heat illness, it takes five to seven days to acclimate yourself to that weather. Continuously down the water. Keep that water flowing through your body. Get shade if necessary. Don't push yourself to overexertion. Canteens, uh, squinchers, uh, electrolytes, uh, wide brims on the hat. You, you name it, we supply it. We do not want any heat-related illnesses. Also, we have high winds down here, the highest winds being up in the mountain regions, and you start getting into the rugged terrain where stringing the conductor, it's a lot harder. You can go back up there today and fly over it, and you'll scratch your head to wonder how in the world did they do that? Big, heavy things that can tear your hand off. We literally moved a mountain. So the wire is attached to the helicopter. It lifts it into place along some pulleys, and then it pulls the wire from tower to tower. Bore a hole underneath I-8 freeway while traffic is flowing uh, across I-8. And we're moving approximately 1.2 million cubic yards of earth. Underground work, trenching, excavation, traffic control. The excavations and the blasting and the towers. With 120 mile an hour rotor wash below you. There are always those kinds of risks because the work that we do in general is dangerous work. The number of opportunities there are for even the smallest thing to go wrong, it sort of boggles your mind. You know that just putting rules in place is not going to get the job done. So one of the things that we did was we've been able to engineer a lot of the safety into the job. The top piece of the tower the weight limit exceeds what our airplane, the Sunbird, can lift. So in order to, to now set it with the airplane, we have to split the bridge into two pieces. Well, the industry standard for setting that bridge would be hover for a very long time and tell some guys on the ground, working under that asset again, could rig some cabling to balance that half a bridge so that the air crane could cut loose and go get the other half and bring it in. So you're thinking about buying, trying to balance about 10 tons of steel you know, on two points while people, you know, three or four people below trying to tie a guy wire. SDG&E worked with the contractor to develop bracing so that the helicopter can come set that split bridge on the tower without having anybody in that area. And I sort of draw a picture back on the back of a napkin to say, I think if we can brace the system and providing more than a two point balance, that would make it much easier. One half of the bridge would be set, and then the other half of the bridge would be set and then rocked and locked into place. Just a little bit, Max. Pick it up on the half side. Your force is low on the stop on the half. They are taking this standard practice now to other utility when they do the similar type of construction. So a lot of these innovations came out of the ethos around safety in the company and also some of the real challenges that this team had to face in construction of the project. In the real world, there's always a better way. The only thing that stops that is people, not in this project. And because it's unique, that gives everybody the ability to say, hey, there is a better way. Regarding innovation, for me personally, I've had a number of people in both the construction industry as well as other utilities give me a call. So I'd like to think that we're on Sunrise, that we've reshaped the way construction projects from a helicopter operation standpoint will go going forward. The project originally was designed to have 79 towers to be built by helicopters. Originally, we are going to have most of the project was going to be done conventionally, and that means being done on the ground with cranes, 
which require access roads. But as we progress through this, the rules were being changed by the PUC and the other agencies that essentially said, no, we're not going to let you build these access roads. So overnight, we've gone from 79 towers required helicopter construction to more than 230 towers. 30 helicopters every day and basically running an air wing. Who would have thought that SDG&E would be operating an air wing? So we're doing the uh, sky crane over my shoulder. You'll see we have heavy lift kinds of activities. And then typical of a construction project of this nature, we have long lined kinds of things. So we have a helicopter with a long line and they lift things and move them in on the project. And then the, the third piece is, is really the movement of people. We wanted as much as we could to avoid overflying roads and homes. So we established flight corridors and it was like a highway in the sky for the pilots to use. So it's 750 feet that you're having to fly in and long lining and making turns and everything. It's just amazing that anybody can navigate through there. Helicopter traffic and congestion in the corridor, that is a big deal. We call it maintaining our situational awareness as a pilot. We have been harping on aviation safety because that has the highest potential of being uh, catastrophic. And we've told the pilots, we've told the people on the ground, if you see something, tell us. Yeah, we want to get production done, but not at the cost of somebody's life. It goes from stem to stern, uh, but it is the same every day. It's just the location and the weather conditions, the environmental conditions that change. We give them a chance to share with us um, some of the safety concerns they have. We want to jump on those right away and see if we can rectify or provide a solution for those. When I was given pilot briefing, my standard thing was a pilot, is, his two eyes are busy, his two ears are full, he's got both hands full, and both feet are at work. So he's, he's pretty well maxed out. When I talk to the FAA agencies about the amount of flying that we're doing, they've outwardly been in awe of what we've been able to accomplish. And then our safety record on top of that, and I think that's a testament to everybody's commitment to do it right. fire prevention compliance, it's right at the top because the Forest Service can shut us down if we're not in compliance, even if we don't start a fire. Our obligation is take a look at our work activities every day. Take a look at them and actually pull out and remove those that we don't have to do. It leaves a chunk, I call it, of work activities that we have to do. And then I think it's important we take a look at those individually and say, what can we do to minimize those risks? Well, you still have a chunk of risk that can start a fire any way you look at it. We go around checking everybody's water cans, make sure everybody has a plasky, make sure everybody has a shovel, make sure that they are following the plan. We don't want to have to fix something, we want to get, it, get in front of it. If it's a large wildfire impacting our work area, it's how do we get them out of here safely, where do we get them to take care of them. We try to encourage our crews to have multiple escape routes in mind. We've hiked them and we found new ones and then we put them into one touch and created new graphics in there and then distributed them to the crews so they know where to go in the event of an emergency. One of the strongest lessons we learned on Sunrise was the, uh, the need for reliable communications. And one of the crown jewels of the project I think we're all so proud of is Sunrise Base. Sunrise Base is a communication center that was put in place to monitor the personnel that are on the right of way and handle any emergencies. The base was created when there was an extreme safety event and they couldn't get resources then because they didn't know where they were. It took an hour and a half, two hours for them to get the 911 help that they needed. So after that, the project management decided that they needed to do something to enhance the communications. So we initiated a project where we selected phones from four carriers along with a satellite phone of 800 megahertz and 900 megahertz radio system and then we began to fly site to site to site to site and test each one of those devices and see which ones worked best at that particular site. Mobile radio communications requires uh, specific mountain peaks so you had to find higher elevations and there's just not enough of them that are commercially available for us to go into and we had to get really really creative. I want to be able to talk to a pilot anywhere on the project that's flying. So we came up with a creative solution to use uh, land-based handheld radios. So we put that handheld in a helicopter and took it up to elevation and, surprise, they worked. You can talk from El Centro all the way out to the coast on these handheld radios. It's very reliable. And we layered in a flight following technology. Never been done that I know of. And anywhere they traveled on the project, we had access to them from Sunrise Base, unique. 
One Touch is an overlay of Google Earth. We use that to plot our workers. So when they call in from a site, we put a little push pin on the map so it shows their exact location. So we can see all of the towers, temporary landing platforms, we have walkout routes, we have weather capability. There's been several other companies that have come in here and looked at the base. How do we transfer that over to Southern California Edison or PG&E or whatever other entity within the state of California? And so we're doing that and we're reaching out to the other utilities as well to, to share this knowledge. One rule I have is we don't go home in Sunrise Base until we can account for everybody. And I think it's been really, really a, a centerpiece for the project. We've formed very good relationships with the people out on the right of way. And uh, so everybody pretty much knows the voices over the radio. Sunrise Base was one of the best examples of the strong teamwork that we had during this project. With the number of uh, contractors we had working on the project, uh, the number of employees, all the diverse personalities and disciplines that were involved, teamwork was really one of the most valuable assets. Our team consists of the safety group, the security group, and the wildland fire group, and they've come together very well chemistry-wise as well as knowledge-wise. All the contractors you have, all the different people from all over the country, between everybody, we all kind of put our heads together and figure, okay, this is what we want to accomplish. How do we do it? We have these master tailgate meetings in the mornings at each of the show-up yards, and we go around, we touch first and foremost on safety. They also talk about environmental measures. We go through fire compliance. It just creates that unity of we're all working together to get this thing done. We have all the knowledge that we need to get this done and we all know what we're doing and we all know the right way, so just help each other out. If you see something and it looks iffy, don't do it. Find a different way to do it. So what I try to do in the tailboards is develop a relationship and we try to be like coaches, counselors, and we're not telling them what to do. We guide them and we try to get them to think. I'm a big believer in allowing the, the group to have time for their own feedback. Don't talk at somebody, talk with them. You have to earn their respect first. You have to earn their trust. It's not the machinery, it's not the aircraft, it's the people behind the machinery, it's the people behind the aircraft. So that's the value of all this, is when this is all said and done, we did this as a team. It's living proof that through building strong, credible, trusting relationships, you can accomplish anything. What I'd give anybody in safety for advice would be if you see something, don't ignore it. Take care of it because you could be saving somebody's life. For us to complete the project as safely as we have with no significant injuries to our employees, our contractors, the public is really a, a testament to not only the performance of our employees, but also the culture of the company as it relates to safety. The devotion to safety is something that I think is one that uh, will go down in the chronicles of uh, great achievements for our company. I'm very impressed with the flexibility, the ingenuity, and the creativity of this project team. It's just been remarkable. And for a team to come together the way we have and have the chemistry that we do and have the success that we have is something that will be somewhat of a legacy for this project that these guys can all look back and say, wow, that was awesome. We did a fantastic job there. And when you're in safety, it's not always easy to say, here's the bottom line, here's what we did. It's, it's one of those things that you just kind of walk away with laying your head down on the pillow at night knowing that you did your best job and it paid off because you just know that people aren't hurt as much as, as they would have been under normal circumstances or have been in the past on a project like this.